Mr. Markison. You have the floor, sir. Well, thank you, Mr. Kittes. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, and Raytown guests. Uh, I appreciate your inviting me to talk about home rule charters. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I've been here before. <laughs> Uh, one of your other uh, uh, charter events uh, was many, many uh, years ago. Uh, we're going to be very informal, and if you have questions at any time, please jump in with your questions. Don't wait till I've paused. I will take some um, uh, pauses to, to give you a chance, but if you have questions, uh, jump in with them immediately. My background, first of all, I worked for the Missouri Municipal League for 40 years. The last 30, I was the executive director. But I retired four years ago, and uh, uh, for kicks, I kind of go around and help cities with charters and train city councils and so on, um, just to keep my mind from turning to mush. Uh, last year, I helped West Plains on their charter uh, to get them started, and they passed in April with, I'm proud to tell you, 77% of the vote. So uh, they did a very good job uh, down in West Plains. And I tell you this, Mr. Chairman, because their chairman was the uh, political science professor at Missouri State and just a really sharp person. And if you have questions, uh, you should feel free to call him. Okay. Uh, he'd be a, a great source for you, and you can get a copy of their budget and all kinds of stuff from him. And uh, you can reach him through their city hall, and um, uh, your city clerk would be able to get the uh, uh, information from their city on how to reach him. Just a brief outline about what I'm going to do this evening. Uh, first, we're going to talk about the difference between statutory cities and home rule cities. Second, we're going to talk briefly about the process and the Constitution, the guidance that the Missouri Constitution gives you for what you're about to do. And finally, we're going to talk about Markinson's advice to charter commissions. Uh, you can take some of this advice, you can ignore some of this advice, there's no extra charge for this advice, uh, and it's based on uh, my experience with probably 15, 18 charter commissions over the years. And your task, of course, is not just drafting a charter, but educating the voters. Drafting the charter is just half of it. Talk about classification of cities in Missouri. There's two types of cities in Missouri. There are statutory cities and home rule cities. The formal name for a home rule city is a constitutional charter city. Home rule city, constitutional charter city, the same thing. I call them home rule cities because I have a hard time pronouncing constitutional charter cities. But you're going to hear both of them, and I just want you to know that they're the, the exact same thing. Let's talk about statutory cities first. There's villages, there's fourth class cities, there's third class cities. And you all know what Raytown is currently. You're a fourth class city. You know what the largest fourth class city in Missouri is? Anybody? No, you're number two. Uh, St. Peter's, St. Charles County. And Gladstone's, not Gladstone, that's my city. Grandview is right behind you. They're about 25,000, fourth class city. As a fourth class city, you're regulated by Chapter 79 in the statutes that sets forth your structure of government uh, and the options you have and the duties of your officers. Statutory cities are governed by state law. You only have the powers and forms of government specifically granted by state statute. And you have relatively few options. For example, you have no authority for initiative and referendum. Uh, the statutes say that you divide your city into at least two wards and elect two aldermen to staggered two-year terms from each ward. You elect your mayor uh, for two years. Recently, there's been some options for fourth-class cities. The council can give the mayor a four-year term. I don't know if you've done that in Raytown. You have, okay. And the council can have a four-year term, but that takes a vote of the people, for the members of the Board of Aldermen to have a four-year term. So, the Municipal League has over the years given you some options, but there's a lot of things you can't do. For example, you can't elect some of your council members at large. They all have to come from wards, two from uh, each ward. 
anything that's not specifically authorized by statute, it's prohibited. Back in the 1960s, fourth class cities had no authority to control weeds on private property. The legislature gave you that authority in 1967. Prior to that, you couldn't require people to cut their weeds. They could grow and cause all kinds of problems. There was nothing that you could do. Same thing with dangerous buildings. That authority was given to you in 1969. You know, if buildings are about to collapse, now you can go in and require them to be leveled off and, and uh, um, made safe. Whatever the legislature gives you, they can take it away. They can either do it purposefully or they can do it accidentally. Every year they accidentally repeal laws they didn't know they were repealing. They have to go back next year uh, and enact them. Another problem is that the statutes applying to fourth class cities are kind of archaic because they've been adopted over the last 130 years uh, by legislators from throughout Missouri to apply to all the fourth class cities. And so what they've adopted to apply to you applies to East Lynn, Missouri, a place I'm going to in two weeks that has about 700 people. So, you know, they may not fit Raytown. Also, you're subject to further changes in the statutes, whether you like them or not. When I was with the Municipal League, every year we had bills in, uh, one saying that in fourth class cities you had to appoint your police chief, you couldn't elect a marshal. And on the other hand, in third class cities, and another bill said you had to um, elect your municipal judge. You couldn't appoint your municipal judge. There's always stories behind these bills, by the way, that go back to a particular city. We'd always have to scurry around and defeat these, uh, uh, these bills, or, or terms of office. They always like to, tr uh, uh, there's always bills dealing with terms of office for collectors and mayors and so on. And what the municipal league would always do is make them local options, change them to a local option. Um, you're going to find people who say, everything's just fine in Raytown. I don't want to change anything. Well, the only way they can guarantee to keep what you have is to put it in a charter, because then the legislature can't change it. That's, th that's statutory cities. And I will take one of my pauses to see if there's any questions so far. We're going to talk about home rule or institutional charter cities now. I have another question. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I didn't pause long enough. Um, I mean, you just made a statement that really concerns me. Uh, so everything that the city of Raytown has adopted as far well as codes and ordinances, if it's if it can be possibly repealed by the state, it could be. Is that what I'm hearing? Well, sure, okay. sure. They could they could uh, remove your authority to adopt building codes by reference, or te all technical codes by reference. Yeah. I just want to make sure that was clear to everybody. Here. Yeah. Thank you. Let you are an, uh, you are a statutory city. The legislature controls. Home rule cities. I have to talk a little bit about the history of federalism. It sounds boring, but it's really fascinating. Going back to the early 1800s, the conflicts between the federal government and the states and the cities, but we're gonna start in about 1865, and we're gonna be really brief. Civil War's over with, everyone's moving west. Coming through Raytown, going west. Cities are growing all over the Midwest and the West. What did a city need to thrive in 1870? What was the interstate highways of 1870? The railroads. And if the railroad hit your city, you were gonna prosper. And if the railroad missed your city, you're gonna blow away in the wind. So what cities started doing is issuing bonds, building railroad spurs to hook up with the railroad when it missed them. Those lines went broke. The bonds got forfeited. People lost their savings. There was a huge hue and cry. There were lawsuits. They ended up in a judge in Iowa, Judge Dillon, in about 1870 or so. And he issued an opinion that became known as Dillon's Rule. Judge Dillon said, cities are creatures of the state. 
and they only have those powers that the state specifically gives them or can be implied. That was the law in 1870, and it's still the law today for statutory cities. But immediately after his decision, the Home Rule Movement began. And believe it or not, Missouri led the way. In 1875, we adopted a new constitution. And in that constitution, we provided that our largest cities could provide their own structure of government by drafting Home Rule charters for adoption by the voters. We led the nation. There are those of us who have spent our careers working in local government who feel that was the last time Missouri led the way in anything innovative for our cities, but back in 1875, we were cutting edge. In 1946, we lowered the population requirement to 10,000 people. And in 1971, we amended the Missouri Constitution again. We did two things. First, we lowered the population to 5,000. And the second thing is far more important. We gave home rule cities much more flexibility and authority to solve their own problems. Prior to 1971, a charter was a grant of powers. And you had to find the power in your charter. So charters would have a section on weed control and dangerous buildings and dog control and everything else. It was in their charters. And eight, after 1971, the charter became a limitation on powers. And home rule cities were assumed to have all the powers not specifically limited or prohibited by the Constitution, by state laws, or the charter. So instead of having a chapter on weeds in your charter, you'd just be silent on it and you'd adopt an ordinance on weeds. What, what did this do to your job in drafting a charter? Simplifies. Oh yes, it simplifies it. You look at the pre-71 charters, look at Kansas City's, look at St. Louis, look at Independence, look at Blue Springs and Lee Summit. 30, 40 pages, much, much shorter, much easier to do. You're doing the skeleton, and it's fleshed out by ordinances later on. You put the basic structure in there, and then it's filled out by ordinances. Makes things much, much easier, much easier. We have 41 home rule cities in Missouri. They've adopted a wide variety of charters and forms of government. Some of them are council manager, like my hometown, University of Columbia or Joplin. Some have city administrator, Blue Springs, Lee Summit, Belton, Raymore. And some just have mayor council, uh, Palmyra, Florissant. The term charter is a neutral term. You may come across someone who says, I lived in Kansas City, they have a charter, I didn't like Kansas City, so I'm against the charter. That doesn't make sense. They're against the Kansas City charter, which has nothing to do with what you're doing. It's what goes into the charter that matters. The term charter is meaningless. It's what goes into it. The basic philosophic assumption about what you're doing is that the citizens of Raytown can best devise their own constitution rather than rely on state laws. That's the assumption. A couple of things that will help you. I've told several of you about the model charter for Missouri cities. It's published by the Missouri Municipal League. Every single one of you need this. It's going to be your Bible for the next year. It's got everything you need to know. It's got uh, a section on all the issues you need to resolve. It tells you everything you need to know about home rules. So if you don't have it, I'm sure the city clerk's office can get those off the MML website um, for you. Also, you can get other charters. Uh, your chairman said he's got four or five that he's memorized already. Uh, 
Again, don't get, do not get any of the pre-1971 charters. You're wasting your time. Only get charters that were adopted after 1971. So don't get Independence or, or Kansas City. So that's what a home rule city is. And any questions about that? I'm going to proceed to Markinson's advice to charter commissions. Oh, good. On the, you said that the charter needs to be that skeleton framework. Mm -hmm. Is there a template of that sort? Is that what you were referring to? The model city charter is your template. And it's got various options, but it's got everything you need. You may want to add other things. You may want to take something out, but it's everything you need. It is the template, yes. Okay. So the, that using that template would be our kind of our skeleton starting place. That would be your starting place. Okay. Mm -hmm. On the cities that you have worked with and have used that, that uh, model city charter structure, how many of them got used only that, or how many got? Oh, no one would use only that, but they would use it as their basis. But the last time we did this, just a few years ago, people wanted to put everything under the sun in it, and it was just a disaster. Um, what would, what do you suggest to cities to look at first? when they're looking at a charter, trying to put together a charter? I, I would suggest you start in chap with chapter one of the, or section one of the model charter and go from there. Chapter one is, yeah, that's, that's the basic stuff. Uh, probably the city council, the structure of the city council and powers of the city council. That's what I'd probably start with. That's often one of the most difficult things. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm going to backtrack because I have not told you what the Missouri Constitution tells you you have to do from this point onward. It doesn't give you a great deal of guidance, but it gives you a little bit. First of all, if you have any vacancies on your commission, someone moves out of town or they get sick or they run out of the meeting screaming, I don't want to hear any more problems with the public works department. They send you a letter of resignation. The members of the commission fill all vacancies. The city council will pay all necessary expenses of the commission. Your primary expenses are going to be printing printing copies of the charter and a uh, explanation summary of the charter. You're going to have some legal expenses. You may have some uh, expenses to reimburse travel if you bring people to talk to you. The charter must be submitted to the voters by April of 2015. God, that seems so far away. <laughs> you have one year. Um, as a practical matter, I think you should be done, finalized completely with your work by eight, eight and a half months. Done at the printers so that you will have time to explain to the voters what's in that charter. If there is a particularly controversial issue that can be separated, you could submit that as a separate issue to the voters. For example, when I lived in Jefferson City, the first time we voted on a charter was in the late 70s, and we still had partisan municipal elections. And the Charter Commission was just unanimous for nonpartisan elections, and they put that into the charter, and the Democratic and Republican Central County Committees got together, and the charter was defeated. Uh, about five years later, we had a new Charter Commission, and um, they put that issue as a separate, they separated that out, and partisan issue, elections won. The, uh, the charter was adopted, and partisan elections won, 
And then about five years after that, the council submitted a charter amendment to go to nonpartisan, and that passed overwhelmingly. A, ch a charter amendment, not an ordinance. Char yeah, you, that's great. And we'll talk about amending the charter in just a minute. In fact, we'll talk about it now. The, the charter is adopted by a simple majority, 50% plus one. Your charter is not like the Ten Commandments. It's not etched in stone. It can be amended. There's three ways to amend a charter. Uh, one way is to elect a new charter commission. Uh, this is used only by those pre-1971 cities that may have lots of changes to make in their charter. The second way is the city council can put a charter amendment to a vote of the people. And two, uh, a petition signed by 10% of the registered voters can put a charter amendment uh, before the voters. So char charters can be amended, and if you make a mistake, it's no problem. We just come back and, and uh, well, it depends on the mistake, I guess. It could be a problem. But you can always come back and fix it. And that is all the Constitution tells you. After that, you've got to rely on Markinson's rules, for Markinson's advice to charter questions. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, real quick, you said one of the reasons one that happens, a charter can be amended is to do by a, a petition of 10% of the registered voters. Um, I assume that's how, that's the avenue of how all charter cities post-1971 operate when they're amending their charters. I guess what I'm getting at, is there any need for a charter commission when they write a charter to put some kind of charter review like you know, I, I have I have heard of, uh, of that being done, and it would say something like uh, five years from from the adoption of the charter, the city council will appoint a review committee to make recommendations to the council on charter amendments. I, I have heard of that. I can't tell you which cities do it, but I do know that some do it. Not a bad idea. So the Constitution doesn't tell you very much. Yes, did you have a question? Uh, mm -hmm. um, you did say that the city council pays for all expenses of the commission. Mm -hmm. And is there, so that's the only guideline, is that the city council has to pay? Let me get the exact word that's used in the Constitution. All necessary expenses. And there's no definition. That is correct. That's correct. I only know of one problem that's caused. I'm trying to think of what city it was, where they hired a law firm and they sent the city a humongous bill and the city negotiated with the law firm and, and, and got it reduced. Was that you guys? Oh! That's why I'm asking. Yeah. Because there, there does need to be some structure to cost. I mean, it just can't be... I'm going to talk about that in my advice to charter commissions, but um, basically what I'm going to say is your officers should prepare a budget and give it to the city so the city knows how to do their own budget and what to budget for you. And that's why I suggested West Plains would be a good city to contact to get a copy of their budget uh, since they just went through it. Also, Nix is a relatively recent uh, charter. It's been about three, four years, but... Uh, they probably have that information on what their budget was. Okay, thank you. Okay, you've all got your oath of office, you've elected your officers. I think the officers should meet and prepare a budget, give it to the city council, give it to the city administrator. That's just fair to them so they know how to budget their own money and, and prepare for you. And also I think you should have a timeline on chapter by chapter, how you're going to do this charter. There's nothing worse than seven months from now waking up and realizing you're only halfway through. Yes, sir? Um, you said the officers do that. Uh, I, I recommend that they do it. There's nothing right. that I'm telling you that you have to do. These are all my advice. Well, and, I, and I'm not opposed to that. I would just want to make sure that we, the officers, whoever they are at the time, would make sure that they brought that to the commissioners for... Sure. Sure, I have them prove it. Yeah. Yep. 
Good point. You prepare it, they approve it. You need to select a meeting time and an adjournment time. The worst mistakes elected city officials make occur after 10 o'clock at night. After 10 o'clock at night, they'll vote on anything to get to go home. Adjourn it, I think you should adjourn at 10 o'clock at night. Um, and it's amazing how people will put their business into the time slot that they have if they know that there's a 10 o'clock <coughs> adjournment. Also, you need the appropriate setting. And I need to tell you, I'm not wild about your setting here. I prefer a conference table with an open spot at the end where people can talk to you. Uh, this is just a little bit too formal, but this is up to you. I'm just telling you my opinion. I would like the city to set up a, 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 a big square conference table with a spot for people to talk to you from. Take it for what it's worth. You need some operating rules. Because sooner or later, later he's going to make a motion, she's going to offer an amendment, she's going to offer a substitute, you're going to say you're confused and you want to postpone it to next week, and you need to know how to take those motions in order. The, the city may have some good operating rules that you could adopt. Some people adopt Robert's Rules of Order, but nobody reads Robert's Rules of Order. Uh, there's a simplified Robert's Rules of Order. That's what we adopted. You've already adopted it. You're way ahead of me. Okay. All of your commission meetings and any committee meetings that you have are subject to the open meetings law. This is very important. You have to post notice 24 hours exclusive of weekends. Who's going to post your notices? City clerk, your secretary. That needs to be um, understood by all parties who's going to do that. There's nothing worse than the Kansas City Star talks about the Raytown Charter Commission violates the Sunshine Law. You don't want that. So you need to make sure who's going to post. Good. Who's going to post? You need to encourage public involvement and keep the news media informed of what you're doing. A lot of charter commissions wait till they have drafted the, the charter, it's at the printers, and then they sit down with the news media. It's much better to meet with them a couple times beforehand. I, I like to take them to coffee. You know, you know who the reporters who cover your city or the radio stations. Take them for coffee and tell them, you know, tell them, here's, here's some of the problems we're having. There's, we haven't quite decided this, but we, we've worked out this issue. They'll buy into the program. They're not, you're not coming to them when it's over with, and they may have suggestions for you. Get them involved. The more people you get involved, the better off you're going to be. Decide if you want to record sessions. I'm sure you've already done that. Okay. Decide if you want to form committees. Some charter commissions will form committees, and the most common ones are finance, administration and legislation, and personnel and transition. Um, and some, some charter commissions work as a group of, 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 a, of the whole. You've got your choice. You need to determine if the city is going to provide you with services or if you have to hire your own secretarial services, legal services. You want to be able to call on an attorney if you need it. Can you call on the city attorney? Uh, that needs to be worked out uh, with your city administrator. I would suggest you invite city officials, past and present, to talk about the current structure of government in Raytown and the problems that they've in encountered. Um, you have, everyone on your commission needs to have a thorough knowledge of the existing structure of government. And I know a lot of you have been on city council, some of you are on city council. Um, but others aren't, and you should bring them all up to speed so everyone has the same, um, the same information. You need public input. I suggest you come up with a list of civic leaders in your community 
and formally invite them by letter to talk to the commission? Most of them won't do it, but boy, they'll sure be flattered that you asked, and they'll know you tried. And they'll remember that. Start your education efforts early. Don't wait till you're done. Talk to your news media. Talk to your civic groups. You need a list of the civic groups, the Rotary, the Kiwanis, the Elks, the Lions, whatever you have here in Raytown, Chamber of Commerce. Don't go to them after you're done. Go to them once before you're done just to tell them what you're doing. So they won't be surprised when you say, hey, next month we're voting on a charter. Whoa, where'd that come from? Get in there and talk to them. So you thought you were just gonna have to sit up there one night a week. And you, you, can spread a, you can spread some of this around. You don't have to do it all on your own. And most important, I'm sure you know this, is when you do your charter, when it's all done, make sure you have a two-page summary of the charter. You know, you may draft a fabulous document. You may be so proud of it. You may think it rivals Plato's Republic. I got a lot of relatives in Raytown. I went to Ace, and they're not going to read your 40-page charter. But they'll read a two-page summary. They'll read a two-page summary. It's not a campaign piece I'm talking about here. It's not vote yes. It's here's what the charter does. And again, the city pays for that too. Okay, what this is is an opportunity for you to draft a charter to conform with the needs of Raytown. Your motto should be preserve the best, improve the rest. Try to approach decisions with an open mind. When you've drafted, when you're finished with your charter, but before it goes to the printer, I'd recommend you have an experienced city attorney review it. And I have a number of really good ones in the Kansas City area. You're blessed with really, some really fine attorneys here, uh, any one of which would uh, uh, do it. And I think it would only cost the city a few hundred bucks, but you need to do that. It needs to be reviewed by an attorney. And then you go to work explaining it, and your work is done. I've given your chairman my phone number, and I'd be glad to entertain uh, if you have questions during your yearly deliberations. Uh, it's welcome to call me. I'm glad to help. Um, other than that, I'm glad to answer any questions you have. We could talk about why some city charters fail. That's always an interesting topic. But then again, you probably <laughs> more than I do about that, so. That completes what I had to say to you, Mr. Chairman. Well, it was very informative. Uh, and I think it was also not only informative for us, but it was informative for the general public that got a chance to hear it because uh, they're the ones that elected us to do this job. I assume this is on your local cable TV. Maybe. Yeah. Yes, it Ooh, will good. I'll have to call all my relatives. Come to watch me. <laughs> they always wondered what I did. <laughs> now they won't know any more than they did before. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. If there's any other questions, Mr. Mark? I will definitely be back. Anytime, sir. Thank you very much. <laughs>